Welcome to episode two of the Soccer Coaching Theory Podcast. I'm Marcus DiBernardo, your host, and I'm excited to get started on today's show because I know that the topic is one that comes up at a lot of clubs across the country. So today's discussion is all about skill acquisition and in particularly the role of technical skills training in a club setting. But before we dive deep into skill acquisition, I wanted to summarize last show um, so it kind of builds into the skill acquisition discussion of today's show. So in episode one, I discussed the meaning of the word theory and the actual theory of ecological dynamics and uh, how I use the theory of ecological dynamics theory as the foundation of my methodology. I also outlined how important it is to connect academic theory to practice session design and ultimately how all that builds into a methodology over time. So I covered briefly my own methodology, which can be viewed on my YouTube channel and on my blog. Now, the last thing I wanted to do, though, is I wanted to kind of revisit that term, representative game design. So I want to make a quick point um, that will lead us into today's topic of discussion, which is technical skill acquisition in soccer. But representative game design. The major reason we want to make sure that our practices are close to the actual game, does it look like soccer? Does it have the unpredictability of a real game, the variability? The reason this is really important is because the environment we create must contain information that is real to the actual game of soccer so we can couple our actions to the real environment. So if the player is running from one cone, popping off the cone, scanning over their shoulder, all those are good things, but is it representative enough? And here's why I say that. There's no real information to couple your action to. Remember in ecological dynamics and complex adaptive systems, the player isn't adapting to anything that is representative of a real game if you're running in between cones. Right, The environment, through direct perception, contains everything a player needs in a training that's representative game design. So how do you couple your actions in a meaningful way to a cone that is just sitting in one place and doesn't move? There's no unpredictability about that. There's nothing, no variability. So it's not part of a complex environment. It's like Bruce Lee saying, boards don't hit back. It's one thing to punch a board. It's another to punch somebody in a, in a dynamic environment where they have defense and they're moving and their hands are up and they have feet. Punching a board is kind of like dribbling a soccer ball in between cones. So I'm not saying that never do a passing warm-up with cones, never to do dribbling exercises with cones. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, I am going to go through the reasons why you would do those things in an upcoming episode. But at this point, what I want you to get are, are the players coupling their actions to a game representative environment where the information being received is information rich to the real game of soccer? Let me repeat that. Is the information, information rich off of direct perception to the real game of soccer? And the skill sets being learned, are they transferable to the real fully representative game of soccer? So when I see like a player scanning, identifying a color of a cone that the coach is holding up, in my opinion, that information is not usable. It is information deficient. There's very little purpose to the exercise except to create the habit of scanning, which might be a reason to do it. But when the player scans, there is no usable information. A color of a cone is not transferable to a game. So at what point does yelling out a color of a cone lose its value? My opinion is it loses value very quickly. And I'm not saying anything negative about technical training, supplemental trainers. They have a huge value in my opinion, but you have to realize that they often work one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. They're limited. They're limited with representative game design, but they can still accomplish a lot of very valuable things 
if they use a wide range of techniques with loads of variability. So now let's jump into this episode's topic, technical skill acquisition. How do players learn new skills? How should we be teaching these technical skills? Do we even need to teach technical skills? And in what environment do players learn technical skills best? Now, there's a lot to unpack with all those types of questions, so I'm going to touch basically on the major points. First, for me, uh, skill is obviously not just technical. It's also the decision-making process. You could put it in a tactical, you know, soccer IQ bucket if you want. And often, these two things, the technical and the decision-making, the IQ, they operate hand-in-hand. Hand. So if you if you make the right decision, but you can't carry out technically what you want with speed and with accuracy and with good technique, then you're going to be unsuccessful. So that's something that you need to keep in mind. Often, again, the technical skills and the decision making go hand in hand. Um, the next thing is, should, the t should a coach spend time teaching technique in a team setting when the kids probably only train with other kids two or maybe three days a week with a game on the weekend. So <clears throat> for me, I look at team training as decision-making time um, spent in trainings that are game representative. And I want players to make maximum meaningful decisions on the ball in those trainings. And I want each player to be able to get out of that training what they need from that training. I don't want a training focused on what a coach thinks one player or a very small group of players need. The game has everything in it so all players can improve if you set up that type of environment. Now, my view is that isolated technical skills can be part of, uh, can be trained at home or with a private coach or from watching YouTube or many other options. Like pure technical training doesn't require a team. It doesn't require your friends. But the decision-making part with the representative game design does. And environments is a big deal here. So we'll talk more about that. So the one other thing I want to go over is the myth that kind of looms out there over soccer coaching that the coach must give the kids technical skill sets. I remember all those old Corvair videos with every kid with a ball and these neat setups with cones all over the place and these synchronized movements. So, you know, what we're missing with all that stuff, though, is the following. The environment itself can create special and unique technical skill sets in players that no coach could ever teach them. So all the technical skills don't have to, you know, rely on being taught from a coach. The most technical player I've ever coached never played 11 v 11 soccer until he was like 15 years old. He only played beach soccer and futsal and, and beach volley. So his skill set was beyond amazing. But this wasn't the result of Corver training or supplemental coach. This was the relationship between the ball and the variability of the environment being the sand, a futsal court, whatever it is. So that relationship, interaction between the environment, the player, the ball, all those things bring about unique skill sets that no coach is going to teach them. It's impossible. So I could go on with this forever about examples of Ronaldinho taking unique touches on the beach, transferring them to the grass, Neymar with his futsal background, Met Ozil with his background of playing in the cage in a small area where the ball couldn't go out of bounds. Over the years, so many of the Ghanaian players that I've coached, you know, they can play on any surface. They adapt their body position so well, uh, the touch on the ball in such special ways. And it's probably because the variability of the fields they grew up playing on. Um, so that being said, every environment is different and not not all kids have the ability to even play pickup soccer after school. I mean, the kids who I coach from Red Bull Brazil, they would tell me they played 14,000 hours of street soccer before they even tried out for Red Bull Brazil at 14 years old. 
I mean, what an environment that is. They were totally immersed in a soccer-rich culture that has so many other benefits of they're being able to model what other great players are doing that they play against. Maybe family members were good players. Just that constant street soccer being available. It was a safe place in a neighborhood that their that their family knew that they were safe on the street. They would watch pro games when they got back to 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 their um, apartments, their houses, whatever it is. And this is you know a a way that they skill acquisition to the highest level. So. I'm not going to get so much into donor sports, but you have to understand that a donor sports, I'm going to get into donor sports in later episodes, but donor sports is a different sport. Like futsal is not 11-a-side soccer. Beach soccer is not 11-a-side soccer. Foot volley, whatever you want to say, those are not the actual game. However, there's they provide a skill set that is directly transferable and usable in the 11 v 11 game. And we don't have to go through all the evidence that has created all these great players from these unique environments. But that that's a, those are rabbit holes we can go down and it takes us all kinds of other places. And there's so many interesting examples of donor sports um, in arena football to box lacrosse. You name, we could talk about them all. But this is this is something that we really have to concentrate on when we talk about skill acquisition. But let's, t- let's jump into say what's maybe a typical club um, environment here in the U.S. This is there's not much pickup soccer on a daily basis, and the team training is maybe twice a week, maybe a game on the weekend. So where will the technical part come from? And I'm all for supplemental trainers, and isolated reps are fine. However, I will say, how representative can you make your training, and can you load up on your training with variability? Can you train on dirt? Can you train on the sand? Can you train on the gym floor with a futsal? Can you serve balls in on, in different ways, in the air, bouncing off the ground? You know, you name it. Can you use overloads, which is something we'll go over in a future podcast? And, you know, there's limitations to these types of training, but... It is useful for sure. Um, one of the things that I don't like to see is say a, a kid's at a club at nine years old and you know doing scissor moves and all this kind of stuff. And my thing is, at 16 years old, if he's still at the club doing these isolated scissors and corvair moves, we're missing the boat here. They, they, there's certain skill sets, and we're going to get into this, that you don't need to keep repeating like that, especially in isolated ways. So... It's one thing to learn the actual technique. The hard part is to apply that skill in a complex environment, meaning the real game of soccer. Coupling your technical skills in these chaotic moving environments, um, multiple players all over the place, this is what takes a lifetime of practice. It's not the actual execution of the skill. I mean, the technical skill itself is really the easiest part to learn. I mean, but adapting that skill and coupling your actions in these complex environments, that is the hard part. So let me give you an example. Like doing a simple push pass back and forth between two cones doesn't really accomplish anything. Training a Corvair term over and over doesn't do much for me. We need to continue to push ourselves in these trainings. So, you know, soccer is not a golf swing. It is not a javelin throw. It, the environment is much more dynamic. Um, and even in golf, like one of the trends is to stop going to the range and just hitting shot after shot after shot. So now a lot of constraint-based training is coming into golf where now you're going to play the entire round of golf with three clubs, with four clubs, right? Now you're not allowed to hit any of your shots within, say, 150 yards onto the green. You have to come up short of the green and then you have to play. It it improves your short game. This is constraints that you're putting on. So they're they're forced to experience different environments by, by, by playing golf where it used to be just, hey, let's go to the range and hit ball after ball. So I haven't even touched on the ideas behind teaching an actual skill though, like breaking it down into pieces or teaching it in the whole, immersing yourself in one skill, or do you take on a variety of skills? 
So performing, you know, do you perform skills with constraints? Um, I, I say absolutely you do. You know, do you, do you use different balls, different surfaces? Do you do it blindfolded? Do you do it barefooted? Do you do it with your weak foot? Um, learning by touch, learning by feel, learning by visual. Do we focus on the external endpoint of, you know, what was the outcome of the skill? Or do we focus on the internal technique itself, the mechanics of the skills? Now, those are really, really important areas of conversation. What I will say is this, that no person is the same, no body type is the same, and nobody actually performs the same repetition twice. So your ideal technique will be different than anybody others, anyone else's ideal technique. It really is based upon what is your athleticism, what is your body type, what is your flexibility, what are your movement patterns. All these things are are massively, massively important. And what happens when you perform a technique, it's actually a, a feedback loop during the whole performance of a technique. They looked at master, um, I think it's iron workers. So they hit the iron with the hammer time after time. No time was that iron strike the same movement. There was variability in every movement that they did. So to try to practice the same thing over and over again in isolated reps, Again, against something that's not dynamic like a cone, I would question how long that value, you know, stays with you. I will tell you that like Song from Tottenham Hotspurs, I heard a story that even in warm-ups, every time he passes the ball, he scans his shoulder before he receives the ball and before he passes the ball. It was kind of interesting to me just reinforcing a habit, and I, I kind of like that. Now, obviously, workload comes into these things because if everything is game representative, then there's a there's a bigger workload. There's more chance for injury. So obviously, you can you can use isolated technical training. You could perform techniques and warm ups, whatever you want to do, whatever whatever it calls for for that day. Like the the game minus one. If you're one day away from a game, maybe you don't want to do very much. Um, game representative training where it's a little bigger workload maybe your idea is just to warm the body up go through some repetitions do you know some maximum exertions after you're you're warmed up whatever it is that fits into your thinking you know that's fine as well for me um but to think that you're learning something by performing you know repetitions through cones with a push pass after a certain extent i would i would go and say you probably are not learning anything at all um, because you're not coupling your actions, adapting the technique to a chaotic environment. So the other thing that's very, very important is when you read all the literature about skill acquisition, you have to be very, very careful not to just say that one domain, just because you can learn mathematics or just because you can learn to play music on a certain instrument, it doesn't mean that that is going to transfer the way the techniques that you learn to learn those things don't necessarily transfer. Those methods don't transfer to soccer skill acquisition. I, I would have a very big bone to pick. Um, and it, it listen, there's a lot of experts out there who say, oh, no, 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 you know, this is how you have to do it. And it goes across all domains. I, I would adamantly disagree with that and I, and again I always say this in a future podcast I'll go over the reasons why. So I'm going to end it there for today and I do realize that I probably created more questions than answers. But the idea here is to stimulate thought and not always give you my final opinion on every single detail. So I want to leave room for some per personal interpretation here. And just to let you know, I did receive some really good feedback uh, and questions from podcast number one that I really sincerely appreciate because that interaction is valuable for me because it forces me to think more as well. So your feedback can lead me to explore other ideas that I, I didn't think of as well. So I'll wrap it up there. Connecting theory, academic theory to training session design. Thanks for listening. And be sure to check out my all my social media channels, my YouTube channel, Instagram, WordPress, uh, all my stuff on Amazon and beyond. Feel free to drop me an email at coachdbernardo at gmail.com. Have a good one. See you.